Okay, so today I want to go over a real quick uh, breakdown on two specific logical operators. It's going to be a very, very short video, at least in theory it's going to be short. It's very, very few slides. However, the specific operators here, one in particular, can stump a lot of people just in how it works. So I just kind of want to dedicate a real quick video specifically to it just as a as a key point because it is a pretty important one going forward the rest of the class so going ahead and touch on it would be pretty nice anyway let's go ahead and hop over so conditional and biconditional statements so let's take a look at those real quick so the first one is the particular one that can cause some issues and if you look at that truth table over there, it might make sense as to why this one's kind of weird. But they're denoted by an arrow pointing to the right. And you'll going to see them quite frequently. But if we read it, at least in this current context, it's going to be read as if blank, then blank. And since we have P, uh, if P, then Q is what this is being read as. I don't read it this way. This is technically the most basic form but whenever I do conditional statements you're gonna hear me say P implies Q that's the one that makes the most sense in my head there's gonna be a slide after this that's gonna show up lots of different ways to read these but I always go for P implies Q just makes sense to me I like it that's about it so this formula proposition indicates another proposition the second proposition does not rely upon the first one though so keep that in mind now, some of these are pretty easy if we think about it. So let's say we have some proposition or some declaration. Uh, I know in the slides you're going to see in a second it's going to be um, so mowing a lawn. I say mowing. I think it's Mr. Smith is the exact um, example they use. So we mow Mr. Smith lawn. Let's say that this is P. Proposition P. Q is Mr. Smith pays you. Okay? Now let's imagine that currently this is just an isolated bubble. Okay? Uh, just as just P implies Q. Alright? So what we're saying is that if I mow Mr. Smith's lawn, or maybe you do, uh, that implies that Mr. Smith will pay you. Okay? So, in this case, we have true implies true. P implies Q. Then we should get true. I mow the lawn. I get paid as a result. Logically, that's sound, and it makes sense. Right? Right. So here, at the bottom, we have false implies false. So I don't pay the lawn. I don't get paid. Logically, makes sense. I don't do the job, I don't get a reward. That makes sense, that's fine. Those two are the easy ones, and honestly the next one's pretty easy too. Let's say it's the only time it's ever false that if I mow the lawn and I don't get paid a result, that doesn't make sense. I, it, it implies I should get paid, that is part of the whole reason I did it. That was the promise that was made. So in this case, I do proposition B implies proposition Q, but it's not true. Therefore, logically, that doesn't make sense. It breaks. I should have got paid as a result. So in this one, it breaks the logic of it. So it's false. Now, the last one, and this is the one that trips people. people. This right here, the second proposition does not rely upon the first. That is important. So this says, if I do not mow the lawn, then I get paid. And you think, why am I getting paid if I don't mow the lawn? Because it's true. This is this implication of false implies true, results in true. And this right here is what that means. So again, like I said, let's just imagine this is an isolated bubble, right? Okay, well, what if I had proposition O? Where we take out this 
the trash or something. Just, just anything, you know? When you do something else, you get paid. So it's not reliant upon the first one, as there's many other things that could lead to Mr. Smith paying me. Or maybe I got paid by somebody else. If this whole thing right here is about me getting paid, it's not reliant upon the first one. It's just the fact here, if I do this job, then I should get paid as a result, and if it don't, then it breaks the logic. If that, I hope that this makes sense because conditional, specifically the relationship between these two here, can be very, very tricky. So hopefully that does make sense. Yep, we're gonna move on. So these are the different ways that we can actually wrap our head around what conditional statements are actually saying. So. Again, here's this example of P, you must respond, and Q, Mr. Smith will pay you. So we have if P and Q, if you mowish on Mr. Smith's lawn, then he will pay you. If P, Q, that's basically the exact same thing. It's different words. And then Q if P, if Mr. Smith will pay you, Mr. Smith will pay you if you mow his lawn. P implies Q, that's the one that I typically use here. Mowing spawn. Mowing Mr. Smith's lawn, God, I hate saying that. Mowing Mr. Smith's lawn implies that he will pay you. P, only if Q, you will mow Mr. Smith's lawn only if he pays. Which is actually another really good one right there. P is sufficient for Q. It's, this one's good, but it's a little bit quirky here. So mowing Mr. Smith's lawn is sufficient for him to pay you. And Q is necessary for P. Mr. Smith paying you, it's necessary for you to mow his lawn. So I think these two stand out for me in ones that I actually like and help me understand the initial statement. Now, there are three specific types of transformations of a conditional statement. They are very, very commonly used in proofs that we'll get to in chapter two, and specifically this one. So we have converse, we have contrapositive, and we have inverse. So these are all a alteration of the conditional statement, but at the end of the day, they all mean the same thing. So, just think about it. P plus Q, Q plus Q. So those ones will not exactly the same thing, but they're all transformations of the exact same conditional statement. So, example here, we have P plus Q is, if it is raining today, the game will be canceled. Converse of that is, if the game is canceled, it is raining today. The contrapositive is, if the game is not canceled, then it is not raining today. And then the inverse is, if it is not raining today, the game will not be canceled. So if you just look at the uh, statement, we have P implies Q for the proposition of conditional statements. And then the converse of that is now Q implies P, so we reverse the order. Contrapositive is the reversed order, but uh, both propositions are negated, and the inverse is the original, but both propositions are negated. Now, for the last one, the biconditional operation. And this one, by name, seems like it would be most similar to the conditional statement. However, there's another logical operation that it is more similar to. But it's noted by double ended arrow, and it reads as blank if and only if blank. So basically, P if and only if Q. And if you ever see IFF, so like P, that's basically just exactly saying a shorthand way of saying if and only if. Now, this one is true only when both inputs are true. So we have true and true, or uh, true if and only if true, false if and only if false, will both result in true. However, whenever they differ from each other, so true if, true if and only if false doesn't make sense, so it's false. And false if and only if true doesn't make sense, so it is also false. Now, this is very, very similar to the Zor operation. Let me write that a little better. It's, it's good enough. Except for it's negated Zor. So if we did say 
P by conditional Q. This would be logical equivalent, which we'll touch on later, to saying negation of P exclusive or Q. So the exact opposite. They are polar opposite of each other. By conditional is true only when the inputs are both the same and exclusive or is true only when the inputs differ from each other. Now, when it comes to order of operations with any operation outside of say negation and uh, conjunction and disjunction, it's very important to pay attention to the parentheses. So if something doesn't make sense, when you start writing it out, so if we were doing uh, E by conditional Q exclusive or R conditional Q, at this point you would you would have to start doing parentheses to specify the actual precedence of these operations and when they should be applied because it's no longer as easy as doing say three times five minus six plus four divided by two or we understand there is some specific order where things need to be applied for we continue on it's not that straightforward anymore so definitely need to if you're going to make your own statements here the parentheses need to be specified Moving on, we can take a look at this P disjoined with negated Q if and only if R, or biconditional R. So first thing, let's just go ahead and substitute these values in. We have true, disjoined, negation, true, biconditional, false. Okay, so we have parentheses, let's do that first. So true disjoint with negation of these two deferred and biconditional, it's like it's just false. Negation, well, we'll get to that in a second. So negation of false is true. So true, disjoint of true is true. And there we go. So we have parentheses first, biconditional statement. They defer from each other, so we end up with a false. And get that false because it's true. True disjoint true is true. Now, if you're observant, you might notice that we have true disjoined with some expression. That basically means everything here can just be ignored. It doesn't matter what it's going to result in. If we had this join with true conjoined with the negated false conditional true my conditional false it, a lot of things going on so on and so forth. It doesn't matter what any of this is because at some point it's going to boil down to a true or false and true disjoined with true and true disjoined with false will both equal true just because we have at least a one here so that's just one thing to keep in mind and that's going to tie into the next actual uh, lecture so just keep that in mind so pretty sure that's all I got for conditional statements and I just want to do kind of a standalone video for specifically conditional statements and throw in biconditional as well because they kind of go hand in hand even though biconditional is more similar to exclusive or conditional really warrants its own kind of standalone lecture by itself just because it can be out of all the basic logical operations it is going to be the one that trips you up so it can be a very obnoxious operation to look at just because sometimes it doesn't make sense to a lot of people and if it doesn't that's perfectly fine just because it is trippy but it's not too bad if you understand exactly what it's saying so that's all i got for this lecture hope you guys learned something i'll see you in the next video